service concludes. This morning we are going to be continuing our study through the book of Ephesians. And the title of the sermon is That You May Know Him. Our text this morning is Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. As your pastor, I pray for you often. I hope you guys know that and feel that. I selfishly ask that you pray for me and for my family as well. But I pray a lot of things. I pray for your well-being. I pray for specific situations when they arise. And I know that you're facing a season of difficulty or hardship, whether it's an upcoming surgery or a death in the family or some form of sickness that you're having to endure. We pray, and I pray for you. I pray regularly for your walk with Christ. That you will be strengthened. That you will be strengthened in your faith and in your boldness to proclaim the gospel as we go out and as God provides opportunities that we would be aware of and see those opportunities to tell others of the love of Jesus Christ. So know, know that as your pastor, I pray for you. And I've made a concerted effort this year to be much more intentional with that. I know in the past, as some of us, I'm sure, are guilty of, someone will ask us to pray for them. And our tendency is to say, oh, well, yeah, I'll pray for you. And then we either don't think about it or it goes on. I've made a concerted effort this year that when somebody tells me a need or a, a, a problem that's going on in their life, to stop what I'm doing right there and either pray privately or pray uh, personally with them in all that they're doing. I've even started to keep a little notebook that when I am asked to pray for an individual or pray about a situation, I'll write those prayers down so that throughout the week I can refer back to them in my private time of study and prayer that I might pray for them and lift them up before the Father. I believe there is great value in praying as a people, but also as the one called to lead in the prayers that I pray over you. I believe that God tells us that there is great value in that. So turn with me this morning to Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. And here we're going to find Paul, their pastor, the Ephesian church's pastor, praying a specific prayer over the lives of the believers there in the church in Ephesus. I believe it's a prayer that we, as your leaders, those that you have called to serve alongside of you, to work with you, to equip and to serve. I believe it's a prayer that we must be praying over the lives of our people regularly. Read with me in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. It says this. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints... I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray this morning as we begin our time together. 
God, we, we need you. And in our prayers, we are confessing a need and a dependence on you. That God, we cannot do this in our own strength. We are enabled to completely grasp the depth of what you've called us to and all that you want us to understand. Lord, even your word, God, your divinely inspired word, apart from you opening our eyes and our hearts to see and behold the greatness of you, God, we can't fully fathom. So God, I pray, that, I pray for our people today, for those that are here in person, for those that are watching online, God, that you would even now begin to prepare the soil receptive, God, to the seed of your gospel, that it would be receptive to hear from you, that you would bind the enemy that would seek to steal away these truths before we even reach the parking lot today. And that, God, that they might take root in our lives, that you might use them to shape and mold the people of your own possession, that we, your people, may faithfully follow after you, God, that you would plant within us a heartfelt, deep desire to see the lost come to know Christ, to see, uh, to see people saved and redeemed through the power of the gospel. And I believe this comes about through knowing you, through serving you, through loving you, because you are worthy. And so God, be with us now as we dive into your text, as we study your word over these next few minutes, God. May it all be for your glory and the good of your In the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. It's once again worth noting that the focus of Paul's encouragement and prayer here is believers. Meaning that these truths that we're going to unpack today belong to you who have already professed a belief in Christ as your personal Savior. Now the good news is that even if you have never confessed faith in Christ, you've never experienced the saving grace that Christ offers, today can be the day in which you turn to God and call on Him, and God's Word tells us such great things in Romans 10, 13, that for everyone, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. So in these last several weeks, as we've looked at all these blessings and all these riches and all this glory, uh, and even the Holy Spirit that we were given last week that we saw, all of these are for the believer. But, but you, even as an unbeliever, if you will call on the name of Jesus, put your faith and trust in Him, you can be saved. Maybe you find yourself there this morning. Maybe you find yourself straying from the faith or living a life more for yourself rather than for God. But the Bible tells us such glorious truths in Zechariah 1.3. It says, Therefore, it say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. It's never too late. You're never too far gone. You've never strayed too far to which the loving arms of God cannot reach you. And that the loving arms of God will not welcome you home with arms wide open. Amen. So these truths today that we're going to talk about are for the believer. They're for those that have confessed faith in Jesus and are seeking to live a life in obedience and honor to Him. Now Paul begins this section. And the temptation may be to think that he's just transitioning from the riches in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, that great, rich passage. We spent four weeks trying to walk through the depth of all the blessings that we have in Christ. We talked about there in verse 3 where it says that he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And just the infinite wealth of information and the wealth of glory that is at the believer's access because of Christ. And because God the Father has blessed us abundantly. And so the temptation is to look at this glorious passage in Ephesians 1 
And then to look at what's coming in Ephesians 2, which is one of the greatest passages in all the Bible. And to think that maybe he's just praying here as an act of transition. He's praying for them in order to kind of segue into this next section, this next chapter. But listen to me, church. That is not what Paul is doing here in the least. Instead, he prays here because there is a deeply rooted spiritual need that Paul understands within the life of the believer. There is something that you and I need to, and the Ephesian church in that day needed to know if we are going to experience the fullness of of what it means to be in Christ. Look at what he starts off saying there in verse 15. He says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Paul states, I, I never get tired of thanking God for you. And he lists a few reasons why he never gets tired of thanking God for them. He says, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a faithful church, a church that is exercising great faith to Jesus. He says, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and also of your love towards all the saints. They love one another. What a great description of a church. That we, of all things, are faithful to God. We love the Lord our God. And that we love one another. And so for this reason, Paul says, I constantly am remembering you, giving thanks for you, and remembering you in my prayers. Now that reality, that Paul's thankfulness, an understanding of their faith and their love towards one another, that understanding that it drives them to, it drives him to pray for them is what forms the foundation of this entire section. What specifically is this prayer, this request that Paul is consistently praying over the church there, the people of God there in Ephesus? Well, he tells us, verse 17. I'm always remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Once again, we see Paul drawing on this Trinitarian framework that he uses so often as he's praying that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the Spirit. Now, why is he praying this? What does he want God to give them? He says that he may give you the Spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Paul does this fairly often in the book of Ephesians. We've already seen it some in chapter 1, where he will use three different words to emphasize the same truth that he wants them to understand. And so here, he intentionally layers up this wordage that the Spirit of God may grant you wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. You see, there's something that is key, that is foundational here, that Paul is praying specifically that God will grant to the people there in Ephesus. And the key point of this session, the key point of this text, the key point of our time together this morning is this, that the deepest need of everyone here today is to know God. Amen. The deepest need of everyone here today, the deepest need of everyone there in the church in Ephesus that Paul is talking to, the deepest today is to know God and to know Him fully. If you're not a follower of Christ, then obviously today we want to invite you to take that first step of faith and to begin to know God as the one who created you and saved you from your sins. For you, it's absolutely true that, this great, that the greatest realization that you could come to today 
is that you have an abundant need for God in your life to know Him. But as we read this, I think there's something we have to remember. Remember the subject of this passage is not the unbeliever or even the seeker, but it's the church. And here's where I think we have to pay a special attention. Because in a certain sense, the church in Ephesus there already does know God. Paul has already said, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and of your love towards all the saints. This is a faithful church that loves God and loves each other. There's not even the remotest sense here that Paul is in some form reprimanding them as if you don't know all that you should know about God. And this is not the same as what we see in the uh, book of 1 Corinthians where Paul is scolding the church for not having matured to the point that they should be by now. There in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 2, he, he reprimands the church by saying, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. And even now you are still not yet ready. That's not what we see happening here in the book of Ephesians. He's not reprimanding them. He's making a request to God on their behalf. And yet Paul is unmistakably saying here that there is a certain spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that is not already possessed by you as the church. And we know this because he prays for them in verse 18. What? That the eyes of your heart will be enlightened. God, open their eyes that they may see and know you fully. The first time I read this, I thought surely it was talking about their salvation from being unbelievers. That as unbelievers, they would need to have their eyes open. And enlightened. After all, this will be consistent with what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. For he says that, speaking of the unbelievers, he says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So yes, in a sense, we need to, we must be praying for those that are lost, that God would open their eyes, uh, that, 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 that the enemy who has blinded their minds, that God would be able to open their eyes and enlighten their minds, and that they would see their need for the Savior. But that is not what this verse is talking about. He is not praying for their salvation, but instead for their further sanctification. That they would further know God. He prays that God will help them to see. And to see what, you might ask? To see Him. To know Him and the depth of who He is and all that He's done. Paul is praying for them to know God in a way that is beyond their ability in their own strength. And so here there's a sense of dependence upon God. That yes, you can know God. Yes, we know God through the reading of His Word. We know God through coming to church. We know God through the things that we see in creation. And yet there's a sense here that there is another knowledge of God. That there's a deeper understanding and a deeper intimacy with God that can only be known if God is the one who opens our eyes to it. Now, I want you to see three things about this knowledge that Paul is praying for the believers in Ephesus to have. Three things. First, this knowledge is a spiritual knowledge. Not a physical knowledge, not an academic knowledge, it's a spiritual knowledge. And as such, it must be given to them and us by God, if we were to ever possess it. You don't get this knowledge through simply working harder or even reading more scripture. He's not calling us to a higher academic understanding of God. He is calling them to a greater spiritual knowledge, a greater spiritual dependence and understanding that only God can reveal. 
That's why he prays there. For this reason, we need God to enlighten the eyes of our hearts. It's the type of knowledge that Jesus points to in Matthew chapter 16, verse 17. There in Matthew chapter 16, the disciples have been asked, Who do people say that I am? If you remember Peter's great response, he responds that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answers him by saying, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but by Father who is in heaven. And so there is a knowledge and understanding that only God can give us, that only God can bring. This is this spiritual knowledge that we must be praying for. An understanding of the truth of who God is and how he wants to impact our lives and work in our lives. So this knowledge is a spiritual knowledge. Secondly, this knowledge is rooted in the heart, not in the head. Now follow with me. This knowledge is rooted in the heart, not in the head. He doesn't pray for our minds to be open, but instead for the eyes of our hearts to be enlightened. This is a heart knowledge, not a head knowledge. There are a lot of people who have head knowledge of Christ, who know details about Christ. And I don't even know what he's pointing out here, is that this is especially true within the church. That there are certain individuals, and I believe what he's praying for here, and, and understand that, that there will be people in the church, maybe who have grown up in the church, maybe that have gone to church for 10 20, 30, 40, 50 plus years. They know every answer. They know all the details. They have all the academic and head knowledge that you can ever hope to acquire about Jesus and about the Bible. And yet for some, there's this very real deficit that they have failed to grasp the heart knowledge of an intimacy and depth of a relationship with Jesus. And so therefore we must pray. We must pray that we might truly know Christ. See, what we really need is a heart knowledge. And this idea of a heart knowledge is an experiential knowledge. The difference in knowing something with just your heart versus knowing it with your head. When you look at this picture right here, you can look at this picture and you say, well, that's what? Honey. Well, how do you know that's honey? Okay, so one, it says it right there on the jar, on the label, it's honey. You also look at the shape and you're familiar that well, this shape or container is often something that we might see as honey. Its color seems consistent with honey. And so in a purely head knowledge sense, we know this is honey because all the signs point to the fact that this is honey. But if I were to take that very bottle and I were to pour it out and I were to stick my finger in it and then taste and smell that honey, is that the same knowledge? Is that the same way that you're telling me that this is honey? No. Why? Because I've experienced it. Because I have tasted and touched and seen and know what it truly is. I don't just know because of a head knowledge, because all the signs point in a certain way. I know because I have experienced and tasted and seen that it is, in fact, coming. It's what Psalms 34 verse 8 invites us to do with God. When it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Don't just know with your head that God is good. Don't just know with your head that God loves you. Experience and know that God is good. Know it in your heart. 
This is the beauty of having walked through life with God and obediently followed God, even through seasons of great hardship and struggle. You know, you who have been through those seasons and have walked faithfully with God in them, you know that God will provide, not just because the text tells you that He will, not just because a preacher tells you that God is good. You know God is good. Why? Because you have seen and experienced and tasted His goodness in your personal life. This is what Paul is praying for his people. They would know the faithfulness and provision of God. See, Paul a pastor, I can see Paul praying this for his people because Paul had experienced this knowledge. Paul knew of God's faithfulness. And when you know of God in this way, when you will walk through some of the seasons in life with God, where when to all outward standings, it doesn't make sense. God, where's the next bill that going to be? Where's the money going to come to from to pay the next bill? God, when are you? How are you going to provide for this need? And when you have walked through those seasons of despair and hardship and devastation, and you know that God is with you in the midst of those because you have seen and experienced His goodness, you want others to know that as well because there is an intimacy and a depth of love that is is unmistakable. So He prays for them. As I pray for you, God, show them Know that it is better to be totally dependent on you in a situation that is uncomfortable than it is to be comfortable and outside of your will. Amanda and I have not always obeyed this perfectly, but we learn through experience to be willing to go wherever God may lead us to go. Several a year and a half ago, when we moved from Alabama, we had some friends who asked us, they asked us, how do you do that? How do you leave the comfort of home, of being just a few miles from your kids' grandparents and your kids being in a great Christian school? How do you do, leave all of that to move to North Carolina, to a city where you don't really know anyone? And the reason simply this, because God has taught us through hardship and trial and difficulty throughout our journey together. He's taught us a long time ago that it is better to be smack dab in the middle of being obedient to the will of God than to trust in any level of comfort or familiarity or pleasure that this world has to offer. I pray this. That you will know this peace and this comfort as well. That you will know in your hearts the goodness and faithfulness of God. But also watch this. This knowledge that he's talking about is also the key to living out the fullness of their blessing in Christ. All those blessings that he's talked about up to this point, all those signs, all those wonderful things that talked about, spent the last four weeks unpacking this knowledge. While, 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 while yes, those we have access to all of those as believers, it seems to me that Paul is telling us that this knowledge, this deeper understanding that only God can open our minds to is the key to understanding and living out of the fullness of those blessings in Christ. He gives us three reasons Paul does here three reasons why specifically he wants them to know God in this way. He says that you, verse 18, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. And what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great mind. So he gives them three reasons. He says that he wants them to know this knowledge so that 
you may know the hope of your calling. Which we know the hope of your calling. What is the hope to which he has called you? When you know God in this way, you're willing to step out on faith and trust in him who has called you. This word hope is not like the way that we often use hope. We use this word hope uh, to mean uh, something that's, that's wishful thinking. I hope that we get to do this, or I hope that this happens. And yet that's not what the Bible means when it mentions the word hope. Instead, it is not a wishful thinking. It is a confident expectation. Know God and the expectant hope that he has called you to. What 1 Peter 2.9 that we talked about last week and in the, in the previous weeks is mentioning when it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies, here it is, of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so he says that I want you to know that when you know God in this way, you'll know the hope of your calling. He says you will know the riches of your inheritance. And we've spent a lot of time over the last few weeks discussing this, so we're going to really dive too deep into it here. But Paul prays that God would open the believer's mind to the absolute glorious riches to which they have as God's chosen people, as God's children that he loves, that he has blessed them richly and granted them an inheritance. And then finally, he says that you may know, so that you may know the greatness of his power towards us. Verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the workings of his great might? Now Paul says, as believers, you have been granted this immeasurable power, the measurable greatness of his power. Power. And it's not just that God, through this knowledge, has granted you this incredible power, but he has proven it. He actually gives five testimonies to the greatness of this power that God has granted to, the, to have access to by the believers. He says this power is the same power which, according to the working of his great might, raised Christ from the dead. So it's resurrection power. It's the power that defeats death and raises the dead to life. And you have that power in Christ. It is reigning power. He says that it's the same power that God used to seat Christ at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. So it's a power that not only has raised the dead, but it's the power that now reigns at the right hand of the Father. Amen. Third, it's an authoritative power. He says... That it's the power that is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. And typically when they use this language of rule and authority and power and dominion, he's talking about spiritual enemies. We're going to see it later on in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And so he's saying that this is the authority, this is the authoritative power that God has not only defeated death, that is not only reigning at the right hand of the Father as Christ, but is the same authoritative power that now has put all of his enemies, all of Satan and his demons and the world and everything else that would seek to oppose God, that he has put under his feet. And you have access to this authoritative power. It is a timeless power, he says, because it is above everything, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Maybe the most mind-blowing of all, it is an overseeing power because he has taken this and he has given him as head over all things to the church. He says there in verse 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Do you know today, church, the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. Well, do you? You see, as beautiful, as beautiful as it is, and as beautiful 
as this reality is, it is also deeply convicting for me as I read this. Because I can't help but ask if this is the reality of all who have Christ. If all who are in Christ, then why is it that so many Christians seem to live powerless, spiritually dull lives? And I believe it's because this, we become comfortable in simply knowing about God, knowing God with that head knowledge, without truly ever coming to Him, crying out and saying, God, we need you to show us the depth of what it looks like to have a heart knowledge in you, to truly depend and and rely on you for all that we are. We must pray, even as Paul prayed here, that God will open our eyes, that he will open the eyes of our hearts to this glorious knowledge of him. Because it is this knowledge, this truly knowing God that changes everything. I go back to what I said at the beginning. The deepest need of everyone here today is to know God. 